believe this or not, it sounds crazy, but I'm loved in New York City. <laughs> People in New York know who I am and they love me. Every day I walk down the street and I get mobbed by people who want a selfie. Nobody stops me and says, I'm gonna give this guy a piece of my mind. I don't like you, sir. And trust me, New Yorkers have no problem doing that. Uh, people say, you know, I like you. You have some moxie. You stand up to government. You stand up to bullies. You fight for your, for your own rights. You may not have done everything right. You may be a super capitalist, but guess what? This city is about super capitalists. This city brought you Donald Trump, brought you Michael Bloomberg, brought you George Soros. This city is about making money. And God help me if anybody's going to try to stop that. And I think that there is that New York loves that character. Uh, the other thing I'd say, Ali, is that nobody knows who else is running in this race and nobody will know who is running in this race if I get the nomination. Because I, I can tell you, I looked at the two people, nobody's ever heard of them and no amount of media, no amount of spending can get them to be well known or as well known as I am. Even if 80% of people say, I'm not going to vote for that guy. Well, the 20% of the 700,000 people in our district who know who I am is 140,000 votes. The amount of people who know or care about these other two candidates is maybe 10, 20, 30, 40,000 people. They can 100% get their vote. <laughs> they can have 100% of the market share. I'll still win in a landslide. And this is what happened in a uh, runoff election with um, uh, Governor uh, Schwarzenegger. Runoffs are weird elections. It's 60 days to the election. 60 days. There's no way these two nobodies become well-known in 60 days. There's no amount of press they can get. The reality is I, I don't think I'd be able to win in a more general election where you plan out for years, you raise money with all the wealthy donors and you, you, you have the big battle plan. That's not something I'm, I'm interested in. This was a unique opportunity uh, to, to uh, get into the house through Santos leaving uh, and, and sort of get this weird 10 month you know, it's supposed to be a two-year term. It's a 10-month term. Uh, like I said, the Libertarian Party is not considered a party, according to the New York State of Elections, because they didn't get enough votes. Even though they're a huge party, they've been around for more than 100 years, uh, the Libertarian Party is, is ineligible to put forth its own candidate. So you have to go get 1,250 at least. Uh, I know Billy's saying it could be as many as 3,000 or more. Uh, Signed petitions, they have to be on eight and a quarter by 11. Is that right? Legal paper, they're not on that page. <laughs> they're not eligible if, if they're not on legal paper, legal size paper, and they have to be in by a certain date and they have to get to be registered to vote in that jurisdiction. Uh, it's all a bunch of complicated nonsense that is set up to enshrine the two groups that didn't have to do any of that. They just get to say, this is our nominee. We're the Democratic Party. This is our nominee. We're the Republican Party. And guess who gets to pick that? It's not Democratic. It's two or three people. It's the Nassau County head of the Republicans that gets to single-handedly pick who their nominee is. I understand it's, it's, it's an unusual situation. Uh, Santos uh, was expelled from Congress, very unprecedented and unusual. But, uh, you know, it's a unique opportunity to get into Congress and say, look, we're going to stop spending money that we don't have and stop borrowing money that makes us dependent and risky. We're going to stop growing the government. We're going to stop uh, using the government as a tool to beat other people up. We're going to use the government for what it's good for, which is things that require big central planning, like a war, like spending our money on health care, for example, which I don't think is a terrible thing, but I think we can spend it more wisely. If there's anybody that knows where there's waste and fraud and crime in health care, it's me. Uh, I think we can find a way to cut our healthcare expenditures over time in half. And I think we can stop regulating the things that are actually bringing us money. They want to regulate AI. They want to regulate crypto. They want to regulate anything they get their hands on. And all it does is it stops flow of money from joining our country. It stops jobs from entering our country. It stops the ability for people to upskill and enter new things. And it's just going to hurt our, our debt deficit even more. Other countries will get that benefit. We'll lose it. And, and we're going to be like Europe, where we're this like stasis of a zombie country with huge amounts of debt and no way out and an entitled country. America is a special place because most people in America don't feel entitled. Most people in America know that if they work hard, whether they're a journalist, uh, which, you know, used to be a respectable profession, has changed quite a bit. The world of journalism plays a really important role in society, especially holding truth to power. But nowadays, it seems like journalism is like enforcing power <laughs> more than uh, challenging it. The good thing is I think media is losing power, um, at least dishonest media. There's always gonna be room for honest media. 
And the internet has let anyone do honest media, including independent journalists, which have risen dramatically uh, out of the clutches of the New York Times and into places like X or Substack or whatever. Independent journalists can make money. They can investigate on their own. They don't need a badge, special badge from the New York Times. And we can learn interesting things from these journalists who are very skilled. My ex-girlfriend could get anyone to say anything. She was amazing at getting people to talk and just had this unbelievable method of, of getting into uh, the right room at the right time to get the right quote. And her problem was that she liked me. Her problem is that every time Bloomberg wanted to write a story about me, she actually had the most read story and most clicked story, viewed story in Bloomberg in 2015 about me. She, uh, every time she wanted to, show the other side of the story that, oh, you know, his investors don't lose any money. So why is he being prosecuted? The Bloomberg editors told her, we can't make this guy lose. The funny thing about Congress, and this is, uh, I used to chat with uh, Peter Thiel about this, that he, he was very upset at the time uh, about President Obama. And uh, I said, you know what, what's wrong with President Obama? And because I was, I'm a Republican my whole life, but I said, you know, this guy's not doing a terrible job. And he said, oh, well, everything, you know, you got to look at this and you got to look at that and you got to look at that. And I said, you know, at the end of the day, Peter, we're still rich. We're still making money. We're still starting our companies. We're still, this is a long time ago. We're still doing really well, right? He said, hey, yeah, that, that's all true. And I said, so who cares? You know, the biggest job of American government is to get out of the country's way. The biggest job of American government is to stop uh, interfering with the people. And I think that being Dr. No, you know, Charlie Munger just passed away. He was considered Dr. No at Berkshire Hathaway because Charlie... <laughs> did, didn't do great investments at, at Berkshire. He stopped bad investments. He told Warren Buffett no many times when Buffett that, wanted to do things. That so, leads me, yeah, go ahead. That leads me to my next question, which is how would you have handled the speakership drama both like in January and the most recent uh, round of drama? That's a great question. Um, in fact, uh, my, my colleagues, uh, <laughs> I think his uncle is, is currently the, the temporary speaker of the house. Um, I don't know, you know, and again, I'm proud to say I don't know, you know, politicians are forced to say, you know, uh, that they do know everything and they don't, you know, that's why we consider them generally to be liars. Uh, I think that that's exactly the kind of stuff in DC I want to stay out of this idea that, you know, you have factions within the party that are warring and things like that. And I know that happens over time, but my focus is the three kind of main things. I talked about, which is ensuring that our country doesn't go broke as one of the, for better or worse, financial people that actually wants to do this. I hope Bill Ackman, look, I, I wouldn't, if Bill Ackman wanted to join Congress, I don't think I'd have to uh, join Congress. He might want to be the president as well. And if you have people like that, like Steve Cohen, like Warren Buffett, like Bill Gates, look, I, 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 there's no place for little old me. Uh, those guys are smarter than me. They're better than me. Uh, let them do this, but they don't want to do it. I, I think that the founding fathers envisioned Congress as a part-time job. They envisioned, of course, the executive branch as a full-time job, as it should be. But Congress's job is to weigh in on, and vote. It's not, to, it's not to really do a whole lot more than that. It's to sparingly guide the country by making a uh, critical new law. It's, it's not to sort of uh, shape the country uh, in a tug of war incessantly to try to get your, your, you know, your values across. Uh, most of the actual legislation that's important, uh, that's been landmark legislation, it happens once a decade <laughs> that law really changes this country. So we have a bunch of people in DC that are, that are fighting over nothing. And it's just this huge amount of grift that is, is really like people trying to obsess over a spotlight. And the reality is they're willing to make the country go broke in order to do that. They're willing to send people to war <laughs> in order to do that. They're willing to erect gigantic edifices of regulation and self-importance to do that. They're willing to use those edifices to fight each other, <laughs> including imprisoning each other. And it's all madness. And, and everyone's watching it go by because one, it's entertaining, but two, it's not affecting their real life. It doesn't affect the plumber. It doesn't affect the teacher. It doesn't affect anybody. It's just this weird separate world that we allow to exist because our country does so damn well anyway, that nobody's sitting there and saying, I'm trying to stop this. The people that we want in Congress are the people that we don't have in Congress that don't want to be in Congress. <laughs> and it's, it's the, it takes a lot before you want to give up a great life, in my case as an entrepreneur, to, to deal with the hassle of and, and the obligation and the seriousness of becoming a congressperson because it is serious. Uh, you know, and like I said, the, the elites of our country, whether it's look at Terry Tao, he's 
the, the world's greatest mathematician, maybe one of the best ever. Some people think he's the smartest person on planet Earth. He's a brilliant mathematician. He does not want to join Congress. His mind could more than <laughs> help us. He could be an ally in all of this. But, you know, he loves his science. He loves his math. He's not interested in doing it. Like I said, Jeff Bezos organized and created one of the greatest businesses in America. No doubt he would help our country if he joined Congress. Doesn't want to do it. Why? It's too much of a rat's nest. It's too much of a place where people are just backstabbing and fighting and they have to be slimy to win. So why do it? It sounds like a mess. Every wealthy person I've talked to, when I've asked this question, they've said, ha, that sounds like it would be, take my life, quality of life from a 10 to a one. Why did I make all this money to, to go pull my hair out in Congress? No way, no thanks, Martin. I'd rather ignore it. And I think that's just the kind of thing that's like, unfortunately, if we all do that, the only people running this country are gonna be people that we don't want them to, that are gonna send us into bankruptcy, that are going to do things like that. One of the reasons all the rich people I know by- Halfway there. You know, well, exactly, one of the reasons the rich people I know own Bitcoin is because they think that it's possible that the US dollar will be worth absolutely nothing. Go ahead, Philip. I had a question. Uh, what do you think about this New York Bit license? It's a big one. Well, I don't know a lot about it, but I think that our country should not be regulating, uh, you know, this form of money that has gotten a lot of acceptance. It's gotten a lot of, you know, potential uses and things like that. I mean, you don't have to be a fan of Bitcoin. You just have to be a fan of freedom. You know, if somebody wants to say, look, I have this electronic database entry and I want to trade you a good and service for it. So be it. Let them do that. That's freedom. You know, uh, question. yeah. Uh, there was a, I forgot the gentleman's name. He opened a, a, uh, stock exchange right next to the one in the main one in wall street and it got, you know, shut down and it was Bitcoin based. It was beautiful, but it was shut down. Do you know anything about that? I don't. I mean, we do have securities laws in this country. Uh, I think we have too many. Uh, and we, we what's funny about law in general in this country is that it's not that we have too many laws, which we do. It's that. We, the laws are very vague and we interpret them in these like very loosey goosey ways that one court will interpret it one way, another court will interpret it another way. And it could take 10 or 20 years before Supreme Court or anybody else decides, okay, this is the way you're supposed to interpret it. And then, and only then, might you have some clarity until the Supreme Court changes its mind again. And I know this from antitrust. There's a key, key law called Aspen skiing is literally about ski mountains. And the Supreme Court of the seventies made this important case uh, about ski mountain competition and every other supreme court since said that supreme court was wrong and it's kind of this funny thing because it's like well isn't the supreme court supposed to like set the facts for life and even then we don't know for sure and roe v wade was a similar mess so we have a very messed up legal system in this country and it's not easy to come up with a good one either but i think that uh the securities laws and things like that they are important to some extent uh and i think like a less is more is a better place to be. I think Gary Gensler and Democrats want a securities paradigm that's virtually impossible uh, to navigate. For example, they hate crypto so much that they won't really let Coinbase exist uh, under any circumstance. Regulation is something that, you know, I'm not a fan of. And I think that there are certain securities or security-like kind of but things. they are a publicly traded company. And, they are. Um... So, you know, they, if, any, if anyone should be subject to regulation by the SEC um, in the crypto world, it would be that. Yeah, they are allowed to, you know, they are subject to like filing a 10Q and a 10K and they have to abide by certain stock market, you know, kind of standards. But I think in terms of like actually regulating uh, crypto itself, you know, the, a light touch is the best touch, um, at, at least a touch that's fair. You know, I think uh, Coinbase sent a letter to the SEC recently begging for regulation. They said, just give us the, give us what we need to do. Yeah, that was, that was all PR. It was a beautifully written, called written of Mandamus. Actually, me and Don Reese start joking about it, because I was like, how much do you think it cost him to get that brief written? And he, he guessed about 15 million. Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> well, they're, they're not just regulating the public company, they're regulating the product, which is crypto. And right. the, the heavy regulation by the SEC is, is uh, in my opinion, you know, just unwarranted. And it's, it leads to more of the same kind of corruption where, you have a fiefdom and that fiefdom is occupied by people who are lawyers and that those lawyers have a revolving door with big law firms and government and it just keeps going round and round and round and to get anything done you need to kiss the ring you need to pay millions of dollars and it's just I, i've been there you know i've been there with the sec where 
you know, if you pay millions of dollars to the right person, a lot of those people work at Paul Weiss, some of them work at Latham and Watkins, some of them work at, you know, at any law firm in New York or DC. If you pay enough people and you hire the right names, you can get, you have a much better chance of getting your thing done than if you don't. And I think that's, you know, one of the things that's a little bit unavoidable. I think the government, um, government has no role <laughs> in, in a lot of this stuff. You know, and that's kind of my general viewpoint on, on everything. Any question that you might have is generally the government. It's not the government's business. You know, that that's my perspective. Um, that's generally. I was just going to say that if you um, only pay people per unit, then essentially you're encouraging them to do sloppy work so they can get it done faster. Yeah, I mean, my, my uh, point on that is that like labor is, is, a, is a market too. And firms have the right to negotiate for labor. Um, I don't think any labor should be protected, to be frank. Um, and that may be something people don't like to hear. But I think if, if McDonald's can find a way to serve burgers with a crash, uh, because a drunk driver uh, did that. There's a famous case in, in Long Island, which is where I'm going for, that a uh, Long Island uh, rock band uh, wrote a big song about it too. It was very famous around here in Long Island. And the amount of tragedy of that happening, a drunk driver um, crashing into uh, a little girl, three-year-old girl's um, car and killing her, this is an unfathomable tragedy that you know could easily be avoided by instituting self-driving cars. But there's a lot of people that don't want self-driving cars. And maybe the technology is ready, maybe it's not. But I do think that we have 50,000 deaths on the road every year and bureaucracy uh, and vested interests should not be stopping driving car, self-driving cars, which theoretically could lower the amount of traffic accidents we have by 90%, save a lot of lives. That's a great point. That's yeah. a great point. FedEx has its public information. Uh, we've partnered with Aurora to self-driving uh, truck company. Yeah, and I think that the, the money we save, you know, people might say, oh, well, what about the 2 million people that drive trucks? I said, well, we, we can get other jobs. We need, we have unlimited demand for software engineers. We have unlimited demand. No, I don't think all of them can do software engineering. No. And actually, like, I would love to ask you this question. It's like, okay, so we know that there's going to be a lot of jobs replaced from truck drivers to, you know, many, most jobs, cashiers, all of that stuff is, is gone, right? And yes, it'd be great if everybody became a software engineer, but that's not feasible. And I think some people might pursue more human endeavors, things that make us more uniquely human. Some things are going to be more technical. But ultimately, I do think it's going to leave, well, you can disagree with that, so feel free, but I do think that it's going to leave a society in a place where there is going to be a lot of people with no real purpose, no financial output and, and I used to be no input I mean and I used to kind of scoff at UBI because uh, I, I didn't think that you know I thought it would lead to inflation etc cetera, etc cetera. but now I'm thinking the more I think about it the more I think that might be we might not have a choice to deal with the people but and I see Philip has thumbs down so I'm actually curious to hear the counter thoughts to this yeah it's, it's really good questions and I, I think UBI is a recipe for inflation it's like mathematically just impossible that it, it doesn't uh, cause inflation. Uh, but uh, I think, or it absolutely will cause inflation, I should say. But I think that the the thing about jobs that's really interesting is that we're at like 3% unemployment. It's like the record unemployment. The labor market is the tightest it's ever been. And I think that if there is a job in government, it's it, and this probably is a state government job, not a federal government job, but it's to skate where it is going. And it is going and has been going to technology for the last 50 years. And if we don't advocate for the teaching of hardware and software and technology in schools at the earliest age possible because this is a technological society you know look around you you know we live in a technological world that is obsessed with technology and it's not stopped and it's not going to stop we have phones in our hands i have two cell phones i have four computer screens in front of me we never stop doing technology no matter if we're making millions of dollars or Quite frankly, if, if we're minimum wage, we, we can't, li I, I know homeless people with cell phones. You know, it's one of these things where we can't stop doing this. And if we start teaching these things at earlier and earlier ages, being a software engineer sounds complicated, but the reality is it's not any more complicated than looking at a toilet. Uh, if you've looked at enough toilets and unplugging them and figuring out how to get them to run again, I look at a car and I say, that's way too complicated for me. And of course I write software engineering programs that are extremely complicated. So I think that with enough schooling, enough uh, exposure 
you know, where we, we can sort of incentivize people to be interested in this stuff, because guess what? This is the number one job out there and there's unending demand for it. And you don't have to be the world's most complex software engineer. There's jobs for people who create websites. You can go to boot camp. One of my friends in here did uh, six months and you can have a software engineering job. You know, uh, now again, he's a smart fellow and there needs to be jobs for people who aren't such smart fellows. And I think AI actually does help that. You know, AI can, you, you can use AI as a helper in your job. And there's people who want to regulate AI. There's going to be jobs, uh, you know, in, there's always going to be jobs in, in different fields that, that are for people that aren't ambitious or don't necessarily want, uh, you know, the best paying jobs in the world. We always need to have those kinds of jobs. Uh, there'll be uh, always jobs for those types of things, but we need to form like kind what? of, well, I mean, there's, there's recreational type jobs. There's, there's uh, hospitality type jobs. Uh, there's certainly uh, more egalitarian like access, for example, like one of the biggest jobs that's come up over the last uh several decades, or I'm sorry, several years, is the concept of a creator. You know, this concept of a, I, I, was, I was an early webcaster, uh, not as early as some, but in 2015, it wasn't that popular to be webcasting. Uh, and now we have this situation where you can create content, quote unquote, on Twitter, on X, on wherever, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitch, and get paid. And this has allowed people who are creative, especially people uh, in the urban community who I know, who have been able to, to go from a life of drug dealing to a life of telling jokes or giving out their, their, their favorite talent and all of a sudden making six figures and being able to get by. Uh, but that is kind of like hitting the jackpot because like most people who try and fail and- Hey, and you, you, YouTube is paying billions of dollars to somebody. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the person that can make their entire paycheck off YouTube, I understand, you know, that, that is a rare phenomenon. But there's a new avenue and a new career possible for people who want to explore the arts that has never happened before. If you want, if you're a comedian, you had one chance which is to go to the comedy cellar and knock the crowd out. That was it. And today, if you have a talent, and there's so many people who have all kinds of crazy talents. Who's that uh, creator that was doing the yum yum, you know, thing? You you can find a way to to create and become talented without necessarily uh, living in a big city where you have to go to LA to make it uh, or things like that. The internet has, has made that a little bit more egalitarian than it used to be. It's brought down some of the barriers, Justin Bieber, social media star into a superstar, never had to deal with uh, living in LA or record labels deciding if he was too good or not good enough, the people decided it. And I think that, you know, this is a, a wonderful thing that's happened uh, and it's gonna happen more and more with every form of talent. Um, so I think that there'll, you know, there'll always be jobs and, you know, it's one thing that humanity over 200 years has never failed to have is jobs and work for people. And I think the, the people who think AI is going to stop that, I think, and I'll let you go ahead to get in one second, I think is it merits, you know, I'm, I, I work at an AI software company. It merits thinking about it, it merits debating, it merits kind of conversation, but it doesn't necessarily merit, you know, hyperventilating fear. Uh, until it actually starts to happen. You know, right now we have record unemployment. So like, you know, I, I don't think we have to wait till the house is on fire to get the fire extinguisher, but if the house is fireproof, the house is doing fine, it's never been on fire, it's, you know, all the plans are in place, you know, I don't think you have to scream that a fire is gonna happen tomorrow. Um, there's some happy medium of like, well, let's keep an eye on this, let's make sure it works out. But we also right now have had, you know, a tremendous success in our economy. And, and the only thing that's, I think, gonna stop that is, is regulation. Sorry, I'll let you talk now. 